All right, everybody, welcome back. We are now going to be doing all of this stuff online, so let's see how this goes. And we'll go ahead and start with a recap. So let's go ahead and just uh, say that we are going to rev uh, review what we did last time very briefly. And to review what that was exactly, we were looking at section 6.5 and 6.7, talking about conservative systems. Right? And the motivation that I gave for this was to think about what, uh, what the velocity had to do versus uh, a gradient for the system. Right? So if we had a particular uh, like constant uh, function that evaluated to a constant along trajectories, then we said that the contours were actually going to be those trajectories and right, the gradient you could show would be perpendicular, right, orthogonal to the solution's direction. So in other words, we wanted to create this idea of an energy function whose contours were the solutions to a particular system, x dot equals, uh, x dot equals f of x. And this led us to a bit more motivation talking about the uh, generic uh, Newton's equation, right? Talking about Newton's second law, where we converted this second order ODE into a first order system of two ODEs. And we constructed uh, the traditional mechanical energy of the system, right? This is the one half MV squared plus a capital V, right? The potential function. And we showed that Solutions to uh, to the simple harmonic oscillator, right? For a specific example here, solutions to the simple harmonic oscillator had to obey this conservation of energy, right? And we we showed that we went through an entire example saying, well, sure, the total energy of the system has to be uh, has to be constant along solutions, right? And that worked out really well for us because we knew what the solutions to the simple harmonic oscillator were. Thank you, Math Fifty Seven. Uh, and then we talked about the damped harmonic oscillator, how that one actually is a dissipative system, right? It takes energy out of the system, right? So we'll come back to, uh, to functions like that or to systems where we dissipate energy when we talk about limit cycles, right? When we try to rule out limit cycles, right? That'll be in the next video. So let's come back here and think of what exactly the generalization looks like, right? Maybe we're, we're trying to mimic what's happening in Newton's second law and saying that there is some conserved quantity for the system. And this function, this E of X that I have uh, in the definition, needs to be non-constant. Otherwise, every system would be conservative, right? Like there's, we want to rule out these trivial examples. So. Uh, we need to make sure that there is a conserved quantity that is a non-constant function, and this energy has to be conserved, or it has to be constant in time, along any solution of the system x dot equals f of x. And when such a conserved quantity, or a first integral, uh, exists for the system, we say that the system is conservative. And, well, Sure, we've already shown uh, that the, the generic uh, Newton's equation, right, if I use one half mv squared plus a potential as my energy function, then sure, that constitutes a first integral for that system. Therefore, this guy is a conservative system. All right. Now, the reason why we care about these conservative systems is that their uh, long-term behavior is actually very, very simple. Right? It can only do a certain number of things. Right? So for conservative systems, we can't have any attractors or repellers. Right? Otherwise, I mean, we went through the proof. Uh, if we had uh, an attractor, say, then we would have to be descending or ascending the, uh, the various levels of, of uh, the various contours in the energy function. And we would have to be conserved, right? The energy is conserved along trajectories. So as I get pulled into the fixed point, I have to be at the same energy level the whole time, which would mean that my first integral was a constant function. 
and that's not okay, right? Our energy functions cannot be constant. Therefore, we can't actually have a first integral for the system. So that means we rule out uh, fixed point attractors and repellers, right? So it means the only things that we can really do in these 2D systems, uh, as far as fixed points are concerned, is be a saddle or be a linear center. Right? That's the only thing that we can really do. And we went to the nonlinear spring as an example. And I believe I actually had this backwards. I think that was the main confusion that I had in lecture last time. This guy right here should just be x minus x cubed. And that'll create the, the appropriate phase portrait, I believe. I believe that's correct. But let's, or at least I think that's where we went, where I went wrong last time. But we went through a nonlinear example and said, okay, sure, we can go ahead and find uh, the fixed points for this system. We can identify them at the origin and at the locations plus or minus one, comma zero. And we can go ahead and classify them, right? The origin we can see is a saddle. And if we take a look at the Jacobian for the plus or minus one points, we actually find linear centers, right? So our linear stability analysis can't actually be trusted because those are non-hyperbolic fixed points. So what we wind up doing is appealing to an energy function, right? And we actually tracked this energy function right up here. Oh, back that up. We tracked the ener energy function right up here, and so we constructed it. We multiplied in an x dot to both sides and integrated with respect to time, and we wind up with this constant function. And so that should be equals constant, right? So along solutions to this system, we have to maintain a constant energy. We have to maintain this, uh, this function needs to be constant along trajectories. So what do we do? We appeal to that energy function down here. We plot what that looks like. And it turns out that the level sets are exactly the contour, or the contours, the level sets, whatever you want to call them, these are trajectories, or at least this, these are the traces of the trajectories, because we haven't assigned any uh, orientation. But these are what these solutions can do. And if we look near the linear centers, we see that these guys are minima of the energy function, right? So that means that near these locations, our contours have to slowly encircle the fixed points, right? Locally, these minima are going to look like paraboloids, and paraboloids have closed orbits uh, near, near the, the max of the min. So that would mean that our solutions have to close up, right? Our contours have to close up near the fixed point, which means that these, uh, these linear centers are not uh, affected by nonlinear uh, changes that are further away from them. So we can go ahead and upgrade any linear center to a nonlinear center, provided we have a, an energy function or a first integral or a conserved quantity, whatever the name you want to give it. If we have a conserved quantity and we look near a max or a min, then those are going to show up as linear centers in linear stability analysis. But because we have a conserved quantity, we can upgrade linear centers to being nonlinear centers. So they are, in some sense, immune to the nonlinear effects in conservative systems. Right? And the thing, the thing that would have killed it last, uh, when last we checked, uh, we would have taken a nonlinear center and said, okay, this guy is uh, not going to close up, so it's really going to look more like uh, a stable or unstable spiral but we can't have stable or unstable uh, anything. We can't have attractors or repellers in these kinds of systems. So that means that the centers actually have to stay centers as we uh, include uh, the nonlinear effects. And we see this in uh, 6.7. We actually extend this to a particular example in the, uh, the pendulum, right? the rigid arm pendulum. Right? And looking at this phase portrait, we think about the left and right dot, uh, dotted lines as representing the top of this, uh, of this 
swing arm, right? They, they represent the same location on the circle. So we're really doing dynamics on a cylinder, right? So same cell, that's what this guy is down here. S1 cross R, that is the infinite cylinder, right? So we're allowing the velocity to take on positive and negative values of arbitrarily large size, but the angle that we're using is between plus or minus pi, which means that we have to uh, close this up. So this actually looks like one of these guys. We're doing dynamics on a cylinder. So uh, it's kind of fun to visualize what's going on on these guys, and I'll let you kind of play with it on your own uh, when you actually close this up, when you create this new phase space. But I digress. We talked about what happens here. We identified two fixed points, right? It looks like we have three, but remember the left and right sides are actually the same location. So the two saddles that we see are actually the same saddle, but we do have this one linear center in the middle, but we're saying that because we have an energy function, right? This, uh, this guy up here, because we have an energy function, the system is conservative, so nonlinear centers really are linear. Are linear centers really are nonlinear centers, and we expect that, right? The the orbits uh, around the uh, around the equilibrium, right? They should they should look like our usual uh, periodic uh, simple harmonic oscillator solutions, but we are guaranteeing that there are actually there's an entire regime of periodic solutions. Uh, provided the energy is not too great. And specifically, we need to make sure that the energy does not exceed the point where these two saddle connections, uh, or does not exceed the energy on the saddle connection here. Right, if it does, then we're gonna have to, we're gonna go all the way around that, uh, around the top, like indefinitely, right? We're not losing any, any energy in the system, so we're gonna continue looping around and around and around the top of that, uh, that circle forever. Right? It just means that we know exactly how much energy needs to go into that system in order to make sure that we go, either we continue going around over the top or we fall into the center of this potential well. But we can also play with the damped pendulum. And what we see here, I've actually drawn in from last time, these two new uh, saddle, con or these two new, uh, what would they be? They would be stable manifolds for the, uh, for the saddle, for the one saddle that's there. And the stable manifolds are actually separating out what kinds of behavior we can expect, right? So in fact, if we have an energy that is above, right, above that separatrix, then we know we have to go around the top of the loop at least once. And in fact, if we, if we go just above the separatrix, we know we're going around exactly once. In fact, that solution there is going to here on this side and continue in and then get trapped. It's going to start uh, start going in toward the origin. Right, so we can extend these guys out. All right, these, these green curves actually do extend further. All right, I can actually continue this guy on the other side, continue him down here. And this, again, is a way for us to predict how many times uh, a, a particular uh, configuration or a particularly particular amount of energy or initial energy that we give the system, uh, we can predict the exact behavior of this uh, in the long term and say, okay, it's going to go around five times, going around, going around 20 times, or maybe we're less than that uh, separatrix, so we're not even going to go around once. But we can separate out those kinds of, of solutions, and that's exactly what we wanted to study. We wanted to figure out what is the nature of solutions to these systems. All right, and that was effectively where we ended last time. It was a it was among one of our shorter lectures, but it was right before spring break, and we let out early. So that means we completed chapter six, or at least the parts that we were going to study, the ones that we care about. 
And in the next video, we're going to go ahead and start on chapter seven. We're going to talk about limit cycles. Right? There's this new behavior that occurs in, uh, in higher dimensions. Right? We allow oscillations. So there's going to be this new notion of what the limiting behavior can look like. And we'll talk about that next time. So I'll see you in the next video.